The next item of business, a statement by Rosanna Cunningham on Scottish greenhouse gas emissions 2017. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Rosanna Cunningham for 10 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, uh, 2019 is a significant year for Scotland's response to climate change. It marks the 10th anniversary of the 2009 Climate Change Act with its world-leading targets and will be the year that we collectively make a step change in our response to the global climate emergency. Today's statement, however, requires us to look back a couple of years to Scotland's greenhouse gas emissions during 2017, for which statistics were published yesterday. This is the period prior to the current climate change plan, and it is worth remembering that these figures don't reflect recent action. Scotland's emissions are reported in two ways. Firstly, as the actual quantity of greenhouse gases emitted from Scotland. On this basis, the picture is positive, with emissions continuing to fall year on year, down more than 3% from 2016 to 2017, and almost half since 1990. Scotland continues to outperform the UK in delivering long-term reductions, and in the EU 15, we remain second only to Sweden. As in previous years, reported progress has been influenced by technical revisions to the greenhouse gas inventory. This time, revisions to historic forestry data mean that long-term progress appears less positive than reported in previous years. Even though Scotland's emissions fell from 2016 to 2017, the long-term reduction reported this year of 47% is less positive than that reported last year of 49%. The statistics also include figures on the adjusted emissions basis used for reporting on targets under the 2009 Act, which includes an accounting adjustment for the operation of the EU emissions trading scheme. This adjustment is based on the assumption that Scottish industry uses a fair share of the permits available through the scheme. In recent years, the number of permits made available across the EU has increased, so the assumed amount being used in Scotland has increased. Although this does not reflect reality on the ground, on this adjusted reporting basis, Scottish emissions rose by 3.7% between 2016 and 2017. Partly as a result of the EU ETS accounting adjustment and partly because of the inventory revisions, the fixed annual target for 2017 under the 2009 Act of 43.946 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent has therefore been missed by around 2.5 million tonnes. This is, of course, disappointing. However, the position in terms of year-on-year -year changes in actual Scottish emissions remains positive. I would also like to correct some media reports suggesting that the target for 2016 was also missed. This is simply untrue. Scotland's statutory annual targets for 2014, 2015 and 2016 were all met and progress remains consistent with meeting the current interim target for 2020. Our new climate change bill includes changes to the target framework to improve transparency and allow for clearer scrutiny of progress. The bill proposes targets based on actual rather than adjusted emissions and includes mechanisms to manage the year-to-year -year effects of inventory revisions. Looking at the statistics in detail shows that we have seen reductions in emissions across most sectors since 1990. Emissions from energy supply and waste are both down by almost three quarters. Industrial emissions are down almost 40%. Residential emissions are down almost a quarter and those from public sector buildings are down by over a third. Agricultural emissions are down by almost 30%. Continuing to drive down emissions in these sectors and tackling those sectors where reductions are more challenging won't be easy. However, we have to meet the challenge. Transport remains Scotland's largest source of emissions and we recognise that emissions from transport have been rising. Scotland already has the most ambitious agenda in the UK for decarbonising transport, including our commitment to phase out the need for new petrol and diesel cars by 2032. And we continue to prioritise investment in active travel and have maintained our active travel budget of £80 million for 2019-20. We are taking steps to further strengthen our policy framework through the review of the National Trans uh, Transport Strategy. Climate change will be a core theme. The Transport Bill includes provisions to support low emission zones and improve bus services. In addition, we are supporting amendments from the Green Party on workplace parking levies, 
which will be an additional tool for local authorities to tackle transport emissions. I visited Glasgow City Council this morning. Glasgow has pledged to become the first carbon neutral city in the UK. And during the visit, I heard more about the ruggedised project, which sees the Council, Transport Scotland and Scottish Power working together to deploy rapid EV charges and support the development of electric taxis in the city. And I hope the example of Glasgow will be followed by uh, other parts of Scotland. The second largest source of Scottish emissions is agriculture. The CCC's scenario uh, for net zero recognises that this sector will remain the most substantial source of emissions because the vast bulk of these are from biological sources inherent in food production. We are continuing to explore the potential for reducing emissions with both the agriculture industry and our renowned, uh, renowned scientific community to find solutions that are beneficial for the environment, Scotland's farmers, and our wider food and drink industry. We should, of course, recognise that our farmers also contribute to emissions reduction through forestry, land use, and electricity generation, for which they must be given due credit. Buildings also represent a significant source of emissions, which is why we are transforming Scotland's homes, businesses, and public buildings to be warmer, greener, and more efficient. By the end of 2021, we will have allocated over £1 billion to tackling fuel poverty and improving energy efficiency to make homes warmer and cheaper to heat. We are currently seeking views on the potential impacts of accelerating energy efficient Scotland, where we can move faster on our targets and continue to support a just transition to a net zero economy across both rural and urban Scotland, we will. Presiding Officer, the Committee on Climate Change acknowledge that higher overall levels of ambition require more expensive and harder to implement options. That is not a reason to avoid taking action. It does, however, mean difficult choices, not just for government, but for this parliament and society as a whole. And it will also mean the UK government playing its part. So I welcome the UK government's announcement following our lead and acting on the advice from the Committee on Climate Change to legislate for a net zero target. The CCC were explicit in their advice that Scotland cannot achieve net zero emissions by 2045 unless the UK does so by 2050, given the number of levers still reserved to Westminster. The CCC advised that Scotland should aim for net zero by 2045 and the UK should aim for 2050 was published on 2nd of May. And the Scottish Government immediately lodged appropriate amendments to the Climate Change Bill and I wrote to the UK government encouraging it to amend its own legislation. In my letter, I also asked for an urgent meeting to discuss the collaborative action needed and called on the UK government to act on carbon capture, utilisation and storage deployment, decarbonising the gas grid, redesigning vehicle and tax incentives to support zero emission and sustainable transport choices, committing to adhering to future EU emission standards, reducing VAT on energy efficiency improvements in homes and ensuring continued support for the renewables industry. And yesterday I received a response, which is welcome, but unlike the government, I, I think this issue is too important to simply discuss in the margins of a meeting on Brexit. The response also fails to offer substantial updates on the specific areas of reserve policy action I raised. I would have hoped that now they have finally decided to amend the legislation, UK government ministers would be prepared to meet as a matter of priority to discuss how reserve levers can be applied to achieve net zero emissions in Scotland and the rest of the UK. Delivering transformative change associated with more ambitious targets means ramping up our own action too. I have previously confirmed that climate change will be at the core of our next programme for government and spending review and we will update the climate change plan within six months of the climate change bill uh, receiving royal assent. In my statement to Parliament last month, I outlined the specific steps we had taken to strengthen our response since receiving the Committee on Climate Change advice, such as new and ambitious action on deposit return, agriculture, renewables, and a change in our policy on air departure tax. This will continue as all Cabinet Secretaries look across the full range of policy areas to identify areas where we can go further, faster. To conclude, while Scotland is demonstrating strong leadership and making strong progress, achieving the transformative changes that are needed in response to the global climate emergency needs us as a country to go further, faster. This will be hard. There will be risks and challenges to overcome. There will also be tremendous opportunities, 
not only in reducing emissions, but in growing and diversifying our economy, improving the well-being of our people, and protecting and enhancing our natural environment. When the First Minister declared that there is a global climate emergency, she said that Scotland will live up to our responsibility to tackle it. And that is exactly what we will do. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement, and I intend to allow 20 minutes for that. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question would press the request to speak buttons now, please, and I call on Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of the statement. There is much to welcome today in the fight against climate breakdown. The UK government has announced that the UK will be the first major country on earth to commit to net zero emissions, a game-changing decision that challenges the rest of the world to follow our lead. In Scotland, we welcome the news that source emissions have declined. Unfortunately, when we factor in the EU emissions trading scheme, Scotland's emissions have actually increased by 3.7%. A large part of that reason is that little has been done to tackle domestic transport emissions. Indeed, they have actually increased in the latest round of figures. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that time has come for this government to replace words with action and mandate that public procurement defaults to electric vehicles where possible? Rosanna Cunningham. Um, uh, I, I thank Maurice Golden for uh, the... Um, uh, the welcome for a significant part of uh, uh, the um, figures that have been uh, published. Um, uh, I, I would, as he might expect me to say, uh, that uh, I would want to say that I think Scotland is a major country and that uh, while the UK reaching net zero by 2050, uh, Scotland doing so by 2045 does put us in the vanguard. Um, I also just want to uh, caution him around the issue about the... Uh, EU ETS scheme because, of course, in a sense, they're, they're like notional emissions because um, these are permits that have been uh, uh, increased in the number of permits and Scotland is presumed to have taken up a percentage. Um, in fact, we haven't and the reality is uh, the, that aspect of emissions is a, is a kind of presumed or assumed uh, emissions, which is why, of course, we're moving in the future to simply looking at straightforward actual emissions. He raises transport, which of course I have acknowledged is a, is a serious challenge. It's not a challenge unique to Scotland. It is a challenge which uh, uh, most countries are having to, uh, are having to face. Um, some are managing to do better than others. Uh, I think we would all recognize that the work that's happening in Norway is absolutely first class, but of course Norway is able to look right across the range of policy levers uh, that allow them to make some of the decisions that they are making uh, on, uh, uh, on, on, uh, on electric vehicles. Uh, and I very much hope that he is going to add his voice uh, to my voice, asking the Westminster government to think very seriously uh, about that. He's, uh, uh, he's asking about a public pr procurement in particular. He knows that there are issues around public procurement that are not simple and straightforward. Uh, but he also knows that where we are able to do things, we will. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Cabinet Secretary says, we face a climate emergency. Some of the sectoral emissions uh, figures are indeed uncomfortable. This is a stark reminder that we have significant challenges to meet our net zero target. But we know it is possible with concerted and urgent policy action, and Scottish Labour commits to making sure, along with others across this chamber, that the reassessment of the climate change plan will be held to the highest standards. Uh, the transport emissions rising year on year is indeed completely unacceptable. Yet already, Scottish Labour amendments to strengthen the LEZ have been blocked by this government in the Transport Bill. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary explain this Cabinet contradiction? And will she meet with me to discuss my amendments to set the Just Transition Commission in statute on the face of the Climate Change Bill, which will ensure the way forward supports affected workers and communities in a fair way throughout the shift to net zero. Rosanna Cunningham. Well, I'm aware that there's a vigorous um, uh, discussion going on in connection with the Transport Bill, but I think the member is well aware that that um, is not something that I would be 
uh, absolutely directly involved in. Um, and, uh, 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 you know, while I have frequent conversations with the Cabinet Secretary for Transport and Infrastructure, um, uh, at the end of the day, he will be making the decisions that he considers to be the right ones uh, uh, to make. Um, I am always available to speak to the member um, uh, about just transition or any other subject. And uh, she knows that we have uh, undertaken to have a look again at how we perhaps might uh, go some way to, 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 to meeting what she wants. But if she wishes a formal meeting, I'm happy to oblige. We move to open questions. So concise questions and answer, please. Would allow everyone to make their contribution. Uh, Mark Ruskell, followed by Liam MacArthur. Thanks. Uh, the statement attempts to explain a missed climate target and restates existing current climate policies. But under Section 36 of the Climate Act, when the government misses targets, it is required to lay a report setting out policies to compensate. So when will this Parliament expect that report? And will it cover public transport, which is missing from this statement? Rosanna Cunningham. Um, well, once again, I'm being asked about a transport um, aspect to this about which I'm not 100% um, certain. Um, I am aware of the uh, members' particular interest in the Section 36, and I will undertake to have a conversation with them separately about that. Liam MacArthur, followed by Tom Arthur. Thank you. As the Cabinet Secretary acknowledged uh, the largest source of net emissions uh, is transport, and yesterday's figures confirm emissions from international aviation have increased 181% since 1990. Yet the Government stubbornly uh, continues its support for Heathrow expansion. Will the Cabinet Secretary not now accept that this position is incompatible with the climate emergency? And will she support my amendments to the Climate Change Bill, ensuring that the added impact of emissions at high altitudes are properly taken into account? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, well of course, Scotland already does... Uh, uh, include a share of international aviation and uh, uh, shipping emissions, unlike uh, virtually every other country who reports on emissions. I understand the Welsh Government has now decided to uh, do the same. I may be wrong in that, but I think that that is the case. Um, uh, the, the member is rightly drawing uh, attention to uh, uh, aviation uh, increases. Um, uh, Scotland, again, is not alone in that. There are a large number of countries uh, where aviation emissions have increased uh, fairly rapidly. Um, and uh, uh, that is something which uh, uh, needs to be worked on. By including a fair share of international aviation and, and shipping emissions, I think Scotland is being much more transparent about this. I'm not uh, aware of the specific amendment that uh, Liam MacArthur has lodged uh, in terms of the climate change bill. Um, I'm happy, of course, as always, to discuss it uh, with him. Um, uh, but uh, I think it needs to be said that good international connectivity is vital for Scotland's economic prosperity in the future. So there is a real balancing act um, has to be brought into play here. And uh, uh, I notice that the CCC advise that net zero can be achieved by 2045 with emissions from international aviation and indeed agriculture being offset through carbon sinks. So there is some work to be done in and around that. Tom Arthur, followed by John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's very welcome that the UK Government have finally followed Scotland's lead and acted on the advice of the Committee on Climate Change to adopt a net zero target day date. However, would the Cabinet Secretary agree that given that the CCC were clear on the need for action in reserved areas to meet our 2045 target, there is now urgent need for the UK Government to engage seriously with the Scottish Government. Rosanna Cunningham. Well, the CCC did uh, make it clear that achieving our ambitions is contingent on UK-wide policies ramping up significantly. Um, that is critical. And I have written um, on the 2nd of May, again on the 20th of May, to the UK Government uh, to request that urgent meeting. Um, we haven't yet been able to uh, organise um, that meeting, um, but it is, uh, we need to discuss the collaborative action needed. Um, while so many levers are still reserved, the UK Government do have an essential role to play in decarbonising Scotland, and they need to accept that responsibility. Um, given the climate emergency, it is crucial that meaningful engagement takes place as a matter of urgency, uh, and I hope to be able to uh, ensure that it does. John Scott, followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I declare an interest as a farmer? And while I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's acknowledgement of the contribution farmers, crofters and land managers have made since 1990 and during 2017, 
Can I ask her what additional support she and Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing can give to agriculture in financial terms, but also in terms of recognition through whole farm measurements of individual farmers' contributions to reducing emissions by peatland restoration, by afforestation and decarbonised energy production on their land? Rosanna Cunningham. Okay, um, that's uh, a question which contains an awful lot of um, uh, detail, um, and I know that the member uh, uh, will understand that the, uh, uh, the range of issues that he's raised there uh, um, uh, do make it difficult to answer in a short space of time. Um, uh, uh, first of all, I would be one of the first to want to recognise the contribution that farmers do make. Um, the way the statistics are compiled makes it impossible to reflect it in the way they want in the stats, but of course we are not in control of that process, um, and until that changes then uh, we are, uh, uh, we are not, uh, uh, we're not able to do so. But I um, am absolutely of the view uh, and believe very strongly um, that we should uh, understand and find a mechanism by which we can reflect the, uh, the real work that is done across a range of sectors, forestry, energy, etc. Because en I think energy was one of the ones he missed out, um, uh, that, that, that farmers are contributing to uh, emissions reductions quite significantly, um, but not really being recognised for that. And I, I think that's very important. Um, in terms of future economic support, um, I think the member will also be well aware that while the current Brexit discussion is going on, the clarity around future support is simply not there uh, and I think I've said to him before that it would be very helpful if the Shared Prosperity Fund which um, the current uh, uh, um, DEFRA secretary has uh, referred to um, was fleshed out a, out a little bit more uh, to become other than simply a phrase containing three words. Stuart McMillan, followed by Alex Rowley. Thank you very much, Planning Officer. Uh, one of the targets previously indicated is the phasing out of new petrol and diesel cars by 2032, as touched upon already in the statement. However, for many drivers, the cost of purchasing an electric car will be prohibitive. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what she thinks needs to be done to actually make this a realistic possibility for people? Rosanna Cunningham. Um, we do recognise that higher upfront costs can be a barrier to consumers and businesses thinking of making the switch to an electric vehicle and that many of the vehicles currently available are in the premium vehicle class, but this will change uh, over the next few years as the market develops and as technology changes. To support uptake of electric vehicles right now, our low carbon transport loan offers interest free loans for individuals and business. In 2018, we increased this from 8 million to 20 million, uh, enabling more consumers and businesses to make the switch. And we've also put in place our plugged in households that is helping housing associations improve access to electric vehicles. Through our funding and the work of local authorities, Scottish electric vehicle owners also benefit from one of, Scotland, uh, one of Europe's most comprehensive EV charging networks, ChargePlace Scotland. And can I add, presiding officer, that if what I saw this morning um, in terms of Glasgow City Council's plans uh, come to fruition, uh, there will be some very remarkable uh, advances uh, made and the evidence of that will be clear for all to see before the end of the year. Alex Rowley, followed by Rona Mackay. President Officer, waste management has shown a 2.6% emissions increase in 16-17. This is disappointing given the efforts of the Scottish Government, local government and indeed the private sector. Can the Cabinet she Secretary shed any light on the reasons for this increase? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, as the, as the member would expect, um, uh, on receipt of these statistics, we begin to look very closely and carefully at what uh, might lie behind them. Sometimes it's a, it's a fairly uh, straightforward issue, sometimes it's not. Um, uh, I was disappointed in that um, uh, as well. Uh, uh, one of the big issues that uh, we have at the moment is food waste, and I don't think people understand that food waste converts to climate change uh, to, to carbon emissions very easily. It's one of these linkages that people don't quite understand, and I suspect uh, a fair bit of it might lie in that, which is one of the reasons why we are trying to drive down food waste, um, because that will have a very significant positive impact if we can drive that down uh, on, on climate change emissions. But the work to, to get behind some of these statistics will, uh, will now be ongoing, um, and I hope the member will continue to uh, take an interest in, in, in waste, and uh, uh, we hope 
uh, and I certainly do, that when we introduce, for example, deposit return, that that will also make a big difference in this regard. Rona Mackay, followed by Alexander Burnett. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Committee on Climate Change fo focused on Scotland's capacity for carbon sinks, mentioned earlier by the Cabinet Secretary, to help us meet our ambitious net zero target. Can the Cabinet Secretary expand a bit further on this capacity? Rosanna Cunningham. Well, carbon sinks and negative emission solutions um, are going to be vital to achieving uh, net zero by 2045. Uh, by, uh, by 2045. There will but by then, there will still be some sectors, most notably agriculture and international aviation, producing emissions. So these have got to be offset through negative emission solutions, such as bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, and what we choose to do with our land, such as tree planting. Um, Scotland has a huge advantage here, which we have to capitalise on, but of course it's that advantage that the Committee for Climate Change has spotted, which is why we've been given the target date of 2045 and not 2050. First of all, we have large expanses of land that through different treatment could sequester rather than release greenhouse gas emissions, and I encourage all members to read the report from Vivid Economics published earlier this year, which is very optimistic about the potential land use solutions to solving climate change. And secondly, the CCC's analysis indicates Scotland is capable of supporting up to 33% of all UK bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. And this will mean commercial scale de deployment of carbon capture, utilization and storage technology, which Scotland is the best placed uh, country in Europe uh, to realize. We have the potential to repurpose our legacy oil and gas pipeline infrastructure. Um, and, but this all does require the UK government to act and it is one of the specific issues that I have raised with my uh, Westminster counterpart. Alexander Burnett, followed by John Mason. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, and noting my interest in housing, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary that since she talks about the significance of emissions from housing and is looking to move faster on her targets, uh, will she now follow the will of this Parliament and support an EPC target of C or lower by 2030? Rosanna Cunningham. Um, well, um, I think that, uh, uh, in fact, I know that there's a fairly um, uh, vigorous debate uh, uh, that has been ongoing in this regard. Um, but I, I would remind the, the member uh, that uh, um, we also have a fuel poverty bill and fuel, fuel, well, Fuel Poverty Act now, I'm being reminded, um, that uh, 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 we've got to make sure that the targets that we're achieving are aligned across that and not do anything in terms of housing that will create a bigger problem in terms of fuel poverty. It's one of the, the, the complex uh, uh, interchanges that there are here that we've got to be absolutely certain that we don't disadvantage groups of people and end up causing an unjust transition, which is the danger if an unplanned and not particularly well thought through uh, um, uh, target date is imposed in an area where the consequences, the negative consequences, could be quite grave. John Mason, followed by Elaine Smith. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned both transport and buildings in her statement, and sometimes the assumption is that electricity is the answer for everything. But uh, does she think that hydrogen has a part to play, for example, in ferries, in trains, and perhaps in the gas network? Rosanna Cunningham. Um, hydrogen and fuel cell technology are expected to play a significant role in the mix of drivetrain options to decarbonise the wider Scottish fleet. And my colleague on my left here advises me that there is to be a policy statement on hydrogen early next year. Um, he's nodding. As well as allowing renewable energy to be deployed across the transport, power and heating sectors, hydrogen has particular benefits in heavy duty transport and intensively used vehicles, which we've already seen in respect of the deployment of hydrogen fuel cell buses in Aberdeen, um, soon to be joined by additional vehicles and a new bus fleet in Dundee. Other heavy duty vehicles using hydrogen fuel, such as refuse collection trucks and street sweepers have also been trialed in Scotland. And we expect to see wider deployment as council and other fleet operators decarbonize their operations on our journey to the net zero carbon target. Um, so Scottish ministers are very keen to support the hydrogen sector in playing the role it can in reducing emissions, as well as realising economic benefits for Scotland. And this is one of those areas where that is very distinctly possible. Elaine Smith, uh, followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you, President Officer. I see only one mention of poverty in the statement. However, I presume that the Cabinet Secretary accepts that rising emissions are likely to affect those on lowest incomes and in more deprived areas the most. And as such, could she tell the Chamber 
whether emissions reduction policies are currently being poverty proofed or if not, how and when they will be. Rosanna Cunningham. We are constantly conscious of that. Um, that is one of the reasons why we set up the Just Transition Commission, because we know how uh, dangerous it can be if, if proposals are brought forward that aren't thought through in terms of their impacts on, on, uh, on groups of people. Um, and, uh, uh, and that is something that we keep uh, and will continue to keep uh, um, uh, under our eye. Uh, you know, the, uh, she will have heard the exchange in respect of the um, interplay between fuel poverty and housing standards and energy efficiency. So we just have to be incredibly careful that we do things the right way so as to, to avoid precisely what I know the member is concerned about. The last question is to Willie Coffey. Thank you. Does the Cabinet Secretary think that the UK government decision to carry forward overachievement from the second carbon budget was the right one? Given the Committee on Climate Change's unequivocal advice from February was that surplus emissions should not be carried forward, as this wouldn't be consistent with the Paris Agreement. Rosanna Cunningham. Well, I did write to the UK Government in March this year to say that the Scottish Government would strongly oppose any carry forward of emissions to future UK carbon budgets. So I have to say I am disappointed that they have chosen to do so anyway. Um, whilst I note that the UK Government has said that the carryover will be used only as a contingency against technical changes to the greenhouse gas inventory, the decision sends the wrong signals at an important time for domestic and international climate action. And it is one of the things that I would hope that I am able to discuss directly um, with my UK counterpart. That concludes questions on the Ministerial Statement on Scottish Greenhouse Gas Emissions 2017. And we will move on to the next statement, please, if members could shift themselves around quickly. <laughs>